Let's go to Lord Song number 103, or it says 102, but it's 103, All Hail King Jesus. All Hail King Jesus, All Hail Emmanuel, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Bright Morning Star. And throughout eternity I'll sing His praises, and I'll reign with Him throughout eternity. All hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star. And throughout eternity I'll sing His praises, and I'll reign with Him throughout eternity. what it's wonderful to do to all hail the wonderful King Jesus and all he does what he does for us is hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock 611 a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord a wonderful Savior to me he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock Where rivers of pleasure I see He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock That shadows a dry thirsty land He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand a wonderful savior is jesus my lord he taketh my burden away he holdeth me up and i shall not be moved he giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings, each moment he crowns, and fill with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him with clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand wonderful to know that jesus always has us and it is so sweet to trust in him in all times 581 
It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the say the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I was sitting there singing that song, How I Proved Him O'er and O'er. Well, you know, it's something that we have to prove. <laughs> our trust in God and rely on him over and over and over again. But it's through it all that he's always there. Number 580. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon His Word through it all, through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon His Word. Trusting in Him and placing our trust in Him and learning over and over again gives us that flowing peace in our lives. 750 last congregational hymn. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. 
I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. Oh, Wednesday when I spoke at the fair, we spoke on worship. And I sang this song at the close, and I just want to share it because it's a beautiful song that just deals why we come before God and is to worship Him. Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope for a life spent in you. Psalms 86 this morning as we continue in the book of Psalms. The moment Paul was saved on the road to Damascus in Acts 9-6, he asked God, Lord, what will you have me to do? That's true of every saved person. When you were saved by faith in Jesus Christ, you turned to the one who saved you and said, Lord, what do you want me to do now? And this should have been your answer. First, you needed to publicly identify with Christ by being baptized. 
You needed to become a good member of a Bible teaching church. You needed to have a desire to serve the Lord. You realized you needed to study and learn God's Word. You needed to pray regularly. You needed to share your faith with others on how you came to know Christ. And most of all, you realize that everything in your life needs to be pleasing to God. This is a good and healthy sign of a genuine conversion in Christ. But sometimes, as we desire to do things for God, we forget just what God does for us. And that brings us to our psalm this morning. A prayer of David. Bow down your ear, O Jehovah, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry to you daily. Give joy to the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and rich in mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Jehovah, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my prayers. In the day of my trouble, I will call on you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you. O Lord, none are like your works. All nations whom you have Maid shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wonderful things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Jehovah. I will walk in your truth. My heart rejoices to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy towards me. And you have delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud have risen against me, and the company of violent men have sought after my life, and have not set you before them. But you, O God, are God full of pity and of gracious long-suffering, and rich in mercy and truth. O turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your handmaid. Show me a token for good, so that they who hate me may see and be ashamed, because you, Jehovah, have helped me and comforted me. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, may you take these words today and enlighten us to how you work in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a wonderful blessing to be a Christian. And in our psalm today, David mentions what God does for his children along with who God is for his children. And Wednesday nights, we'll get back together this week and we'll continue to look what it takes to have a healthy prayer life and what it means to pray. And one of the greatest things we learn in our prayer life is that God listens. And David understood this in verse 1, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. And in verse 6, Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. David knew that God was not some impersonal God or some impersonal force who's not concerned with our problems or our welfare. He understood He was a personal God. A God who's interested in every area of your life, who's concerned with your problems, who's concerned with your difficulties. He actually gives attention to our day-to-day -day affairs. He listens to us. He hears us when we pray. He's close by. He's always available. He's always waiting for us to fellowship with Him. I mentioned before that there are times when Joan's talking and I'm sometimes preoccupied. Act like I'm listening. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When in fact I hear, but I don't listen. Then she gets my attention and I begin to listen. And suddenly I have my full and undivided attention to her. Yes, I had no choice. I want you to know God's not like that. He's never preoccupied. He never misses a thing to say that we say. Everything we say to Him is important to Him. 
But we need to understand that, you know, there's times that God actually chooses not to hear our prayers. Listen to John 3, where Jesus said, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. For if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he will he hear. God doesn't promise to hear an unsafe person prayer unless it's a prayer asking God to save him. Let me see if you can understand it. Say you're in a room filled with people. Uh, if you could see some of the pictures of the Midway during the fair, I don't know how anybody could know who anybody is in there. They were so packed in there. But all of a sudden you hear, Mom, Dad, Grandma, you hear somebody yell. What happens? We all turn around and look. And then once you realize it's not your kid, what do you do? You turn back around and do what you were doing. You're not concerned. That's the way it is with God. If you're not one of His children, you don't have the privileges of the relationship of being one of His children. He doesn't hear you when you cry out. But there's another reason that God refuses to hear prayer, and we saw that in Psalm 66, 18. It said, If I regard iniquity or sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The psalmist was a believer in God. But he said, if I allow sin, if I have things in my life that are unconfessed in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. God doesn't promise to hear the prayer of a backslider until that person repents and turns away from his sin. Oh, it is true, once saved, always saved. And there's nothing that can take you away from our relationship as a child of God. Yet sin damages that relationship. Sin grieves him. It makes him angry with us. But he never stops loving us. When one of your children would disobey you, they don't stop being your son or daughter, do they? No. But you're not happy with them. And your fellowship with them is broken. It's only when they acknowledge what they've done, ask you to forgive him, that their fellowship is then restored. But you never cease to stop loving them. So how do we restore fellowship with God once we've sinned? How will God hear our prayers again? John tells us in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's wonderful to know that we have a personal God who hears us when we cry out to Him. But once we surrender our life to Him, He also keeps us. Look at verse 2. It says, Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O Thou, my God, save Thy servant that trusteth in Thee. How many of y'all have ever had a garden or have one this year? You know, if you've had a garden, you grow tomatoes, squash, green beans, black-eyed peas, whatever the vegetable may be, okra. And when it comes to the fall time of year, what happens? You have vegetables all over the place. You don't know what to do with them. They're all over your kitchen counter. They're in bags. They're in buckets. You give them to some friends. Uh, you've done all you could do. So the only thing left you do is what? Preserve them. You take and you put them in a canning jar. You heat it to a certain temperature. You seal that jar. You, you place them up so they're there for the next time. Ready to enjoy once again. But preserving food like this does two things that have actually spiritual applications for us. So next time you're canning something, think of this. Preserving food makes it last. So when David says when God preserves his people, he makes them last. That's what we call the eternal security of the believer. Once a person places his trust in Jesus Christ and is truly saved, they shall forever and never lose their salvation. Paul tells us in Philippians 1.6, Being confident of this very thing, that he that which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. When God starts something, he finishes it. And if he starts a good work of salvation in you, you can be as confident as Paul was that God will perform this work into the day of salvation, which is the day of Christ. What is that day of Christ? The day of his return. 
So Paul says, you can be confident of one thing that's sure, that what God has started in you on your day of salvation, He will continue, He will never stop until the day you return home. But second, when we preserve food, it not only makes it last, but it keeps the food from all contamination. In 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you have were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God says He will confirm you until the end. The word translated confirm here means to keep you, to establish you, to make sure you reach your final destination, full salvation. And in that state, he promises that you will be blameless, without sin, preserved. How can we know that? Because Paul said God's faithful. God keeps His promises. He performs what He says He will perform. He finishes His job until the day at the very end. A faithful God who says that you'll believe in Him will give you everlasting life. A definition of a life that never ends. So God hears our prayers. He keeps us. He preserves us. But you know, one of the greatest things God does for us is bring us joy. Verse 4, Rejoice the soul of my servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift my soul. True joy is found where we serve Christ. In fact, you will only find real joy when you are right in the center of God's will. The psalmist says, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift my soul. The world tells us that, you know, if you serve God, you're going to miss out. But the truth is, the only place for abiding joy that lasts in all our troubles and trials and struggles is found in serving and loving God. God is joy. But you know, there's conditions to that joy. First of all, God says you must be obedient. Jesus said in John 15, John 15, 10 and 11, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So we must abide in His commandments so that our joy may be full. Listen, there's no more miserable person than a Christian who is not abiding in the will of God. But He tells us we must also walk in the Spirit. In Galatians 5.22, we see the fruits of the Spirit. And those are love, joy, peace. So abiding joy comes from the result of walking in the Spirit. That means walking close with Him, listening to His prompting, obeying each step of His way. So, so how do we find this joy? Where does this joy come from? This joy comes from Jesus. He will fill us with joy. You know, so many people in this world today are looking in relationships or things to fill their life and make them happy. They'll get frustrated. And eventually... Either people or things will fail us and let us down. And your joy only lasts as long as you can keep these shiny things shiny or up to date. If not, it causes you to lose joy. Did you know that these things will never fully satisfy you and fulfill you and make you happy? If they could, why would we even need God? If we can find happiness in the things of this world, why do we need God? Because that's the only place we're truly going to find joy. And if you're looking for happiness in the things of this world and seeking joy in the things of the world, you're only going to make yourself more and more unhappy. The psalmist says, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. We have to look to the Lord to fill our life and give us satisfaction. He'll never fail us. He'll never become outdated. His joy is permanent. You can have the joy of the Lord even in the midst of a great struggle or trial if you're looking to the Lord for your joy and fulfillment. 
know, some of the most joyful people I've ever met are people who are suffering, people who have incapacities, people who are poor, people without spouses or children, because their life is not wrapped up in the comfort of their health or their ability or their things or their people. They're wrapped up in the Lord. And even though they have these things in their life, if you start to notice, these are the most joyful people in the world. Because their focus is not on the things of this world. They're on the things of God. Under thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. I haven't always done that. And when I haven't, I lose my joy. But when my heart is set on my Savior, I could sing the song we sing, The joy of the Lord is my strength. And we learned that when we were a little child. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He is. That's where we find joy. If we could find joy in the things of this world, why do we need an iPhone 15? We got to have the next one. We got to have the next thing. We got to have the most wonderful thing. Why are there divorces so much? Because it's got to be the next thing. They're searching for joy in things other than the Lord. Hear us, O oh God, he tells us. Keep us, God. Fill us. But most of all, God, teach us. Verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I'm so glad that I don't have to figure this Christian life out by myself. God teaches me and leads me along and helps me grow in the Lord. How does this happen? We're not filled with knowledge of God the moment we're saved. But Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10 explains it this way. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's how we gain knowledge in God. You're not just going to get knowledge and know everything there is about God. We're constantly learning every day. God teaches us through the power of the Holy Spirit a little by little, bit by bit, but only as we listen and learn by studying God's Word. You know, one of the greatest things God does for us is deliver us from hell. Verse 13 says, For great is thy mercy towards me, thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Hebrews 9.27 says this, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. And this judgment is described in Revelation 20, in which all those without Christ will be judged by God and cast into the lake of fire. Why would anyone want to go there? And the greatest thing that we have is the fact that we don't have to go there. God has provided an escape. Jesus came to earth to die for our sins and take away our sins if we'll just trust Him as our Savior. You have the promise of Jesus Himself. If you will just live for Him and trust Him, He'll give you eternity in heaven. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus in John 3? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believeth in Him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. And then He went on in verse 18 He said, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And then in verse 36, he told him, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. I don't know how clear you can get. You know, what will you do if there's a fire? You look for the nearest fire escape, won't you? You do everything you can to get out. God has given us a fire escape. He's given us a way to escape the fires of hell. Why don't people use it? Hebrews 2.3 says, Hebrews 2.3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Don't neglect the great salvation God has provided through His Son. 
Ain't it great to know that all God does for us? He does so many things. But in verse 17, it also tells us that He helps and comforts us. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thou, Lord, has helped me and comforted me. When you're in the valley of despair, the Lord reaches down and helps us. And when He chooses to allow us to go through a trial for our good, it's for His divine purpose, and He's always there to comfort us. I have faced so many insurmountable obstacles in my life. I've faced so many what seems unsolved problems. I've been through unbearable trials in which God either came and delivered me, or He took me in His arms and says, Listen, I know it hurts. Guess what? It hurts me. But you have to go through this fire for your own good and for the good of my kingdom. But I'll be with you and I'll take care of you and I'll comfort you. These are the qualities of God that set him apart and make him superior to all other beings and things in this universe. God is eternal, all powerful, all knowing, everywhere present, unchanging. He blesses us because of who he is. And in verse 5, it tells us, He is a good, loving God. For Thou, Lord, art good. All the blessings I mentioned flow from God's goodness. First Chronicles, First Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. And David said in Psalm 31, we saw how great is thy goodness, O God. God is good. God is, as we saw in Sunday school, the definition of good because He is holy and righteous. He's set apart from all sin. But in His dealings with us, His goodness means that He does what's good for us. No, no matter what we face in life, no matter how bad things seem to be, God's good. And God's goodness is what sustains us through hard times. When we go through difficult times, how blessed to know that God who loves us and cares for us is watching over us, sustaining us, guiding us, providing for us, will never leave us, always quick to forgive. That's our good God in hard times. And the greatest blessing we have that when bad things happen to us, He promises that somehow... I don't know how, that he's going to turn those bad things into good. Paul said in Romans 8, 28, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. But God is also merciful and gracious in verse 3. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. David talks of God's mercy in verses 5, verse 15, verse 16. And in verse 15, he also tells us that he's full of compassion and gracious. Mercy and grace are two very important words in a Christian's life. Mercy is when God gives us what we do not deserve. Or does not give us what we deserve. Let me, let me rephrase that. What do we deserve? We deserve hell. We deserve judgment. We deserve separation. Why? Because of our sin and rebellion against God. But if we trust in Him and His mercy, He promises not to give us judgment. So He does not give us what we deserve. But grace, on the other hand, is Him giving us what we don't deserve. Unmerited favor, people call it. Good things He does for us that we don't deserve or merit. We don't deserve forgiveness of our sin. We don't deserve eternal life in heaven. We don't deserve a personal relationship with God. But because God is full of grace, if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, He offers these gifts to us free. Think of it this way, mercy and grace. A child disobeys you. You're angry. You go to them ready to punish them, in, intending to just lay down the law, and immediately their tender heart comes before you broken of their disobedience and in tears. They admit their guilt and ask you to forgive them. 
What do you do? Well, I was going to punish you, but because you're sorry for what you did, I'm not going to punish you, even though you deserve it. That's mercy. Not giving them the punishment they deserve. But then suppose all this just happens, then you go, hey, guess what? Go get your shoes. I'm going to take you to get the biggest ice cream you ever had. That's grace. That's the last thing that child deserves is to go out and get ice cream. But because you love them, because they confess their wrongs to you, you do something for them that they don't deserve. That's what God does with those who place their trust in Him as their Savior. He showed His love for us by sending His Son to die for our sins. And if you turn to Christ and trust Him as your Savior, God shows us mercy and grace. In His mercy, He withholds the judgment we deserve. And with His grace, He gives us wonderful gifts and privileges. But we serve a God who is also full of compassion. Verse 15, But Thou, O Lord, our God, full of compassion. Do you know what the difference is between pity and compassion? It shows God has pity on us in here, but He also has compassion. There's a difference. Pity is an emotional response to something that makes you sad. Compassion is the act of that response. So you see somebody on the side of the road who is destitute and having trouble, and you go, oh, man, it's a shame they got to live like that, and you keep on driving. That's pity. But if you go, man, that's terrible. I need to go do something for him. That's compassion. I'm so glad that God didn't have just pity on us as he looked over the portals of heaven. Well, look at those poor, wretched humans. They're living without me. They're not fulfilled. They're filled with pain and hurt and emptiness. Too bad. And he just goes about his business and done nothing. But that's not who God is. He looked at our sinful condition. He looked at all the pain and suffering that sin brought on our life. And He had compassion. He did something about what He saw. And what did He do? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed on Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But David also tells us in verse 15 that he's long-suffering. You know what long-suffering means? Patient with people. Boy, the Lord tried to teach me that these past two weeks. It's hard to be patient with people. Especially, it seems like it's getting harder to be patient with people. A teacher was helping one of her students put his boots on. She was pulling. He was pushing. The boots still wouldn't go on. Once she got the second boot on, she worked up a sweat, and she hears the little boy say, uh, Mrs. Smith, they're on the wrong feet. She looked, and sure enough, they were. It wasn't as easy to pull them off as it was to put them on, but she managed to keep her cool and getting the boots back on. This time, she put them on her right feet, and he says, these aren't my boots. <laughs> so she bit her tongue, and once again, she struggled to pull them off, these ill-fitting boots, and he says, well, they're my brothers, though. My mom made me wear them today. She didn't know whether to laugh or cry at this point, and she mustered up the grace to wrestle the boots on her feet, and she says, now, where's your mittens? He said, well, I stuffed them in the toes of my boots so I wouldn't lose them. I think that's how it's getting in this world someday, <laughs> trying to keep patient. It's hard to be patient with people. But aren't you glad that God is patient with us? Some people look at the state of the world and shake their head at God and say, God, how can you let the world go on like this? They forget that God will not overrule the free will of men. He lets us choose Him or our sin. But there are unintended consequences of choosing sin over God. Selfishness, anger, hatred, immorality, death, war, greed. We could go on and on of the way our world is now today. Why does God let the world go on like this? Because He's patient with people. He's long-suffering with us. He's extending an opportunity that all should be saved. I mean, He could zap us at the minute we sin, but He's long-suffering. He desires that no one will go to hell. 2 Peter 3.9 the Lord is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
So if you die and go to hell, it would not be because of what God has done for you. He's extended you many opportunities for you to come to Him. And He wants nothing more than you to trust in Him as your Savior. And He patiently waits for you to respond. And the writer of Hebrews asks this very important question in Hebrews 2.3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God is patient with us, but someday his patience will run out. And eventually the Bible says that every person who neglected God's free gift of salvation will face judgment and hell. And David gives us then in verse 5, the one thing that's the greatest blessing that God's ready to forgive. The word forgiveness literally means to dismiss, to pardon, to release. Because of our sin, the Bible teaches us that we have a debt to pay to God. But Jesus paid the debt in our place. And if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, God will cancel that debt and forgive our sin debt. How can we have forgiveness of sin? Look at verse 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. That's all it takes. Call to God in prayer, amid your sinner deserving his judgment, and confess your faith that Jesus died for your sins. Paul said in the New Testament, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a blessing we have that we serve a God who hears us, keeps us, fills us with joy, teaches us, keeps us from hell, helps us, comforts us because he's a good God full of mercy and grace, long suffering, patient with us and always ready to forgive. So that takes me back to the beginning, Christians. God's done many things every day for your life. What are you doing for him? How are you serving Him or pleasing Him with your life and your actions? It's time. There's things we say that are happening in this world over in Israel and everything else. And, and Lord, we just, you're coming. I can feel it. Lord's coming soon. Things are falling into place. Things are happening that God said would happen. It's in His Word. We believe that. But God also said, they need to hear. And how shall they hear if somebody don't go and tell them? Why don't we believe that? If we believe the Lord's coming back, we should have a desire now more than ever to tell people that if you don't have your life right with Christ, this is what's going to be offered to you. You know, it's time to stop sugarcoating. It's time to stop mincing words. You know, we're not getting any younger. God may not give us another day to tell someone. So take the time God's given you. And like Paul said, the minute he was saved on that road to Damascus, Lord, what will you have me do now? Lord, what will you have me do now? I've just seen everything you do for me. How good you are to me and gracious to me. Lord, what will you have me do now? Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your wonderful blessings that you bestow upon us and who you are that we saw in your word today. Lord, give us that desire. Give us that will. Give us that strength. Give us that boldness that Paul and Peter and the other apostles had. Paul was a very straightforward person. Lord, may we be straightforward with what you have to offer for so many. And be ready to share what you've done for us in our lives. What will you have for me to do? You know what God told him? Paul, go. 
Go here and see this man, and he will teach you in all things of me, and then tell others what I've done for you. The simple cry God gives to all of us when we surrender to him. And Lord, may we know this morning for sure that our life has been surrendered to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's all. Stand number 340. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As flow continues to play. Do you need to turn your eyes upon Jesus this morning? Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim when you realize all the things he did for you in his glory and grace. One